Good afternoon and welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 ECHO series. We're delighted to have you join us for today's session. My name is Jackie Sable. I'm a member of the ECHO team and I'll be facilitating today's session. A few quick announcements before we begin. If you've not already done so, please put your name, email address, and affiliation in the chat box for our record keeping purposes. We ask that you stay muted unless you are speaking. You can use star six on your phone or click on the microphone icon on the bottom left side of your Zoom screen. You can also use the chat for communicating. We realize that question and answer time is important to you and we try to categorize and address as many questions as possible. But if there are any unanswered questions at the end, we will always follow up via email afterwards. If you have suggestions for future COVID-19 ECHO topics, please feel free to share them in the chat tool or you can email us at echo at psu.edu. Please remember that if we do talk about cases, no personally identifiable information or PHI is allowed. We are recording these sessions and we share all materials and recordings after each session. In the spirit of ECHO's All Teach, All Learn, we'll be on a first name basis during the session. Today's session will include a lecture focusing on Hispanic families and breastfeeding during COVID-19, and that will be given by Nikki Lee, Liz Chang, and Leslie Cree, and that will be followed by discussion and question and answer. Please, during the session, feel free to put your questions into the chat. We'll be monitoring them, um, and after the, the lecture, we'll categorize and address any questions that come in the chat or any that you have afterwards. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Nikki, who will get us started. Hi, my name is Nikki Lee, and I'm the lactation consultant for the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. So I'm just going to give some foundational information about breastfeeding with COVID. And then Leslie and Liz are going to take it into more of a clinical, family-focused presentation. So in the big picture, Every health organization in the world continues to recommend breastfeeding. So we knew about breastfeeding before and we recommended it, we're still doing that now. The basic um, information from the CDC, if a person is breastfeeding and is presumed or positive for COVID, she can take steps to avoid spreading the virus by wear, washing her hands before touching her baby, or before touching her pump or bottle parts, and wearing a mask while breastfeeding. And again, the Leche League International is a lovely resource, and they have a whole section in Spanish, so it, it will address the families that we're focused on, talking about washing your hands for 20 seconds. Um, the baby is going to certainly love breastfeeding as much as ever, and breastfeeding is still recommended because it's a boost to the baby's immune system. Keep the baby with you, breastfeed as much as possible, wear a mask, wash your hands, wash your hands, wear a mask, and breastfeed. We just keep saying those over and over again because that's the basic truth of the situation. Um, again, this is from the World Health Organization, and I've given you a link. So they're the largest public health organization in the world, and they're saying the same thing. If she's COVID positive, she should wear a mask. Human milk is still the best food for human infants. It's an immune system boost perfect nutrition. And another advantage of breastfeeding now is that no one has to leave home to get it because she's got the milk wherever she, she is. Currently, and people have been doing research on this in Italy and South Korea and the US and all around the world, COVID does, has not been detected yet in breast milk. So we're not concerned about transmission via the milk. And our goal here is to let our families decide about breastfeeding. Do they start? How do we help them? We help them to continue if they choose. So if we're working with pregnant families, we wanna make sure they understand what they might expect in the hospital. And Leslie will address that more in her presentation. And as before, if she intends to breastfeed, let everybody know. 
What happens to her in the hospital can depend on how sick she is. If she does have COVID and she has symptoms, that's going to have an impact on her care. And here's a picture of a mother and baby doing skin to skin after delivery. And this is how she can do it if she's COVID positive. The evidence supports the practice. The CDC talks about this in depth. We would encourage healthcare providers to coordinate with the family and the mother to make the decision about breastfeeding. And we've given you a great link here and I'm gonna take a couple of slides here and talk about what this share approach involves. So that you have a discussion with your client. Breastfeeding is still recommended. I hope you're considering breastfeeding your baby. We're gonna help you do that. Um, help your client to explore and compare the treatment options. You know, if you are COVID positive, well, the chances are we will see about getting you a private room where you and your support person can be during the whole time that you're in the hospital. People have each, everybody, all of us, not just our families, not just health professionals, everybody in the world has their own beliefs and values. So we need to respect those and make a joint decision and then assess and evaluate the impact of that decision on the family and fine tune the care plan as needed. Lactation professionals in the hospital are still available. They are deemed essential workers, so they are available to work with every family to help with breastfeeding. And if she's not able to breastfeed, then we can help her. To, we, I say we because I'm one. In fact, everyone on this panel today is a breastfeeding professional. Um, we can help her with breastfeeding or expressing milk. If she's sick and chooses to express milk, maybe she's too sick to actually be taking care of her baby. We want to encourage her to pump, provide her own pump for her, um, have her wash her hands before and after she pumps, and encourage her to take milk out at least eight times a day. You have to take milk out to make it. So at least eight times in 24 hours, take milk out and feed that to the baby. And if she's very sick, it might be somebody who is well could feed the milk to the baby via bottle. This is a slide, a refreshing slide that reminds us about what normal babies expect to do. And they're gonna wake up to eat eight, 10, 12, 15 times in 24 hours. This is normal behavior. The poop color change is a clue as to breastfeeding being on track. So the poop is gonna be black for the first couple of days, then it turns green. And at, at the end of the first week, it's going to be yellow. People need to understand that breastfed baby poop is always soft. Peas aren't always so reliable to check as a sign of intake because babies can pee and poop in the same diaper and you don't know but poop is always a reliable guide. And when the poop turns yellow is when the baby's gonna start gaining weight. So this is the foundational information that people can go home with because everyone's concerned about knowing if their baby's doing well and if breastfeeding is going as it should be. Now, when the COVID positive mother is home, there's a bit more of a challenge because she might be living in a small apartment and she might have other children running around. So the ideal guidelines might not be possible to be implemented. She can always wear a mask. She can always wash her hands before and after. And there's some new research talking about washing your hands at least five times a day is a significant factor in reduction of spread of infection. All in all, we can do is our best. Ideally, if the home is big enough, she can go in her own room and stay there and have everybody wait on her which is all what a new mother needs anyway. If she has been away at school or work and now she's furloughed from that because it's everything, work is closed, school is closed, she might be really surprised at baby behaviors. She might be used to breast, you know, breastfeeding at home in the morning and at night and on weekends and the rest of the time the baby is being fed by bottle by somebody else. And now she's home all the time and the baby is so happy that she's there. And the baby wants to be held and carried and breastfeed a lot. And if she's not ready for this, she might think that there's something wrong. But the truth of it is, 
This is a surprise because she hasn't been home to experience, but it's actually perfect. It's lovely, happy baby, yes. Your baby is fine. This is normal behavior for a newborn. So our job might just say, yes, breastfeed that much. Your baby is, it's perfect for you and your baby. And we have to remember too that breastfeeding helps keep her calm and centered, which is something we could all use right now in these challenging times. I've given here um, a selection of really good websites because we don't want our families just going to Dr. Google and typing something in and taking whatever the first website is as a guide for practice. So I've given you some recommended ones. Um, this one also comes in Spanish. Very beautiful and clear. How do you know your baby's getting enough milk, which is what families are concerned about. How to squeeze milk out of her breast. Maybe her breast gets swollen as the milk volume increases, or maybe she can't get to a pump yet. So she can certainly take milk out with her hand. And this is a very beautiful and respectful video illustrating that. Um, articles, Kelly Mom, any kind of breastfeeding questions that any parent, any family has, any healthcare provider has. This is a gigantic, evidence-based, beautiful website that we encourage you to use and share as a resource, kellymom.com. For pregnant families and for people at the in the first couple of weeks of breastfeeding, a video such as this one um, shows mothers and babies working it out together themselves. It's again, a very respectful and evidence-based free resource. For providers who are always concerned about safety for mothers and babies, we wanna know about medications. So here is a resource from the National Library of Medicine where any medication that needs to be prescribed can be looked up and you can understand if it's compatible with breastfeeding or not. And if you're a provider and you want to prescribe a certain drug and LACMED says, nah, they will also give you a list of alternative medications that will have the same impact and have been found through research to be safe to use for the baby in lactation. Our, um, the three of us on this panel are all members of the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Breastfeeding Coalition, and we have a great website, and we have resources to share with you. So this is a screenshot of our homepage, but I encourage you to go to this website, pabreastfeeding.org, and explore all the resources that we have, because there's a huge network across the whole Commonwealth where there's professional help, there's where you get pumps in your county, where you find local mothers who are breastfeeding who want to help other mothers, county by county. That's just one resource that's available on this website. So free and check it out and maybe even come join us because we need everybody on board. Breastfeeding is everybody's business. As far as cleaning pump parts, this is the CDC's page where you can, she can download in English or in Spanish how to keep your breast pump kit clean, the flanges and other equipment that she needs. So this again is a gift from the CDC. Pennsylvania Breastfeeding Coalition is another resource for you. There are lots of people that are involved in the coalition that would love to help you breastfeed. We wait to hear from you. We do virtual visits. We do virtual consultations. We do classes. Um, we are available to help providers during this time as well. And so check us out. That's pabreastfeeding.org. And now it's time. Are there any questions at this point? And if not, then we'll continue on and introduce the next presenter, who I believe is Liz. Hi, my name is Liz Chan. And my title here, Impregnated and Breastfeeding Mother. Next slide, please. During the, the current pandemic, the fear and anxieties about my birth 
have only escalated. I am suffering. This is a quote from a client of mine. Her name is Rosa. Research shows that the majority of Hispanic families distrust the medical hospital system. I am introducing another quote here from my research. A Spanish preference Latinas had significantly more pregnancy-related anxiety about their health and safety and childbirth and concerning the medical system compared to the English preference Latinas and non-Hispanic white women, end quote. I just wanted to um, start this presentation by uh, giving you those quotes of those um, clients of mine. Um, it's very unfortunately that we're going through this uh, pandemic uh, but women, Hispanic women, are definitely being affected of, of a great extent. Their families are, uh, are suffering, as that uh, client of mine that say there. We, uh, as healthcare providers and as uh, mothers and families that care for the Hispanic community, need to provide uh, up to date referral lists. The healthcare providers must give an up to date referral list of cultural appropriate mental health counselors, local doula providers, local lactation counselors, uh, local social workers, uh, the Breastfeeding USA resource where mothers can call for telehealth consultations, uh, all the telehealth services that other providers are given in the community this day. We must provide us uh, at the hospital and uh, a whole uh, array of hands-on support and guidance because as we know, they are in desperate need. They are in a fear. They, they have a lot of fear. They're, they're scared anxiety. So during the pregnancy, they're scared anxiety. During the uh, uh, postpartum, they're scared anxiety. Uh, we need to uh, provide them with doc documentation. There isn't the language and it's Spanish language. Sometimes uh, we, we take that for, for granted and we don't give uh, the Hispanic community all the information that needs to be given in their Spanish language. Research shows Hispanic women do not want to be separated from their infants. The majority of Hispanic mothers find isolation between the mother and the newborn to be cruel. So this is something that we need to uh, be aware of and consider when, uh, when separating the infant. If the mother is not in need to be separated from the infant, uh, there should be a discussion between the healthcare providers and, and the family. Research shows Hispanic women want to have family support inside the delivery and operating room. And as of right now with COVID-19, the trend is to, for all the hospitals to separate the families, not to allow to have any support. Some hospitals allow one uh, family support inside the delivery room, uh, but uh, not in the operating room. This is something that uh, uh, is, is very needed right now, especially for the Hispanic mom that is such an invulnerable population. There is a vast misinformation in the sense that formula might be safe. Um, the World Health Organization, WHO, and CDC it says that women with confirmed and suspected COVID-19 can breastfeed and if they wish to do so. So this whole thing about um, agreeing and believing the formula is the safest thing during uh, this pandemic is actually incorrect. And we need to, as healthcare providers, we need to have the, the understanding that if the mom, a Hispanic mom, wants to breastfeed and uh, she, uh, she is, is experiencing, uh, you know, all, this, all, all these questions, perhaps a lactation consultant can actually have a conversation with her. But um, first, uh, in, first encourage a human male breastfeeding before uh, moving into a formula quickly. Next slide, please. This is a quote from another mom. 
Women say they were motivated to breastfeed because of their knowledge and observation of its health benefits for mother and child. They say breastfeeding is ingrained in their Hispanic culture heritage and in infant feeding choices of female family members were particularly influential in women's own decision to breastfeed. Women say they experience embarrassment about breastfeeding in the United States and as a result, often chose to initiate formula feeding as a complement so as to avoid feelings of shame. As the quote basically tell us, uh, there is so much misinformation and there is a lot of shame for the mothers. Uh, Hispanic culture heritage brings uh, very ingrained uh, that uh, breastfeeding is, is a muscle. Breastfeeding is something that they do. Breastfeeding is something that we do, we breastfeed. So we need to understand that the formula feeding usually comes as because of to avoid the, the feelings of shame. Next slide, please. I'm quoting this uh, from actually from people that I, healthcare providers that I have heard them saying, the milk is not in yet. Uh, we as healthcare providers need to be very aware how we communicate with the mothers uh, during pregnancy and postpartum and when, when referring and talking about human milk. That term of the milk is not in yet sends negative information to the mother and to the family about the, the breast milk. The breast milk is there. The breast milk needs to be activated by having and allowing the mother and the baby to enjoy a skin to skin right after delivery to, uh, for the baby to suck at the breast and to remove the breast milk. If the mom is too ill for her to actually hand spread and remove uh, the breast milk and, and for somebody to actually give the, uh, the human milk that was collected in a bottle to the baby, to the infant. Hispanic mothers that I have counseled read online that the virus does not spread through breast milk, but their fears of contracting the virus and passing it on to their offspring discourage them from breastfeeding. And this is very much so, this is the case of what, what we are actually seeing right now. Um, uh, it is very important for us as healthcare providers to connect these women with up-to-date referral lists of culturally appropriate mental health counselors. So then the mother would not be isolated alone and then they have someone who can talk about uh, the, their, their issues about feeling uh, sad and with so much fear. Next slide, please. Research shows that Hispanic mothers will benefit from receiving mental health services. This is another quote from uh, another client of mine. Her name is Marta. I was staying home after 24 hours of giving birth and my baby was staying in NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit, until I do not know. Marta. Research shows that a large majority of hospitals discharge mothers within 24 hours. And this is definitely the trend right now. Our hospitals uh, are actually trying to rush and then uh, send the people home uh, quickly, sometimes even less than 24 hours. For a mom that has experienced um, a lot of fear in, in uh, a delivery that it was not desirable, uh, this is traumatic. So we um, we need to, as healthcare providers and as family members, we need to be very aware of what's happening and have discussions with the mom and being there for support. Next slide, please. Next slide. Many Hispanic women fear that their children will be removed by child protective services if their babies lose weight or are concerned on their weight. And this is a big issue that I have seen and I actually witnessed. Um, mothers that, um, Hispanic mothers, they, they come with all sorts of um, trauma 
and uh, all sorts of ideas about that their babies are going to be removed from them. So we, um, as healthcare providers, need to understand where all these ideas come from and actually have a talk, have communication with the, the pregnant woman and the postpartum woman about what are the fears? How come? Why, why are they thinking that? Um, if the baby is losing weight, well, at uh, the beginning, that's actually normal. Uh, we have to have discussions with the mother. We need to make time for, for communicating and asking the mother, how do they feel? What are the issues? Uh, and give them plenty of information in their Spanish language. Cultural traditions allow the mother to do the cuarentena which is the 40 days, 40 days of postpartum recovery for Hispanic women in the United States. And most people need to understand here in the United States that this woman, uh, Hispanic women, they are very well aware that the quarantena are those 40 days for them to heal. So healthcare providers need to learn uh, more about this cultural tr tradition. La Cuarentena provides the mother with plenty of direct care, love for their body, for the newborn, protection and support by the family. The family members often take care of the mother by providing with traditional nutritional healing herbs and food. So La Cuarentena is something very ingrained in our culture for almost every, every Hispanic mom understands the Cuarentena and they want to be able to achieve it. Next slide. This is a quote from some of my research. The eruption of traditional social support resulting from the act of migration itself and its effects, such as isolation and physical segregation, undermines one's ability to cope with the pregnancy and delivery in a healthy manner. And another quote from my research, there is a lack of family social support for immigrant women after they gave birth. So these are all the sources that you can actually find the information and the studies from this, uh, from all the things that I have quoted. I just wanted to say that we as healthcare providers, the way that we communicate with the moms, the way that we approach, the way that we understand culture, the way that we give information, uh, and again, in the Spanish language to this Hispanic families are so very crucial and important. They were crucial before, but even more so now. If we can connect the families with all the support and resources they are within the community, even better. We need to take an approach of always connecting this mom, always making the time to actually make a phone call, to follow up with them, to, um, put them in connection with those people that are there to help them. If the mom is having a struggles with um, understanding the language, finding somebody in her family who can come and actually speak with us in the language and be able to have a, uh, somebody who can translate. Thank you so much. Now I just pass it to Leslie. Okay, thanks, uh, Liz. That is a lot of um, things to think about when we're all doing the social distancing. And I know everybody's feeling a little, you know, we call it stir crazy, but for a culture where the family is really providing so much direct care and support um, for moms to come home and, um, not really have that resource. So um, my presentation is kind of change focus a little bit and look at this through um, the mother's eyes as far as um, perhaps common fears. Um, as my role as a hospital-based lactation consultant, um, most of my work is inpatient um, the first 24 to 48 hours after delivery. And there are threads of common concerns and um, sometimes moms don't know where to ask their questions or what is normal. So um, with that said, we'll move into um, some things that can help our moms uh, maybe navigate the system a little bit more easily in the absence of having family around. Um, next slide. 
preparing for the hospital. Um, hospital stays um, traditionally have been what they call the um, family-centered care, maternity care. Um, but now with COVID, um, hospitals are not allowing visitors, visiting policy um, the way they used to. So now you have uh, one support person. That support person um, is a company's mom for the laboring, but also stays through postpartum. And that is only the one person. Um, folks aren't allowed to um, hand off, you know, for instance, um, partner for delivery and then mom come for postpartum. It's one person. And um, what else is different is that um, mothers may be tested for COVID-19, even if they are healthy and asymptomatic. Um, some hospitals in PA are moving toward um, testing on admission for scheduled procedures, such as a scheduled cesarean or a scheduled induction. Um, that is, I think, going to move toward universal based on a, a conference call I was on with um, Keystone 10 hospitals. Um, so mothers might wonder why they're being tested if they don't feel sick. Um, and that, you know, to let them know that that is a universal precaution. Uh, next slide, please. So after uh, delivery, um, the usual um, protocol or procedure is that um, uneventful healthy delivery, um, whether that's vaginal or cesarean, a mother will hold her infant skin to skin. So that is that uh, position upright between mother's breasts um, as depicted in the photograph. And um, the difference is that with COVID, a mother may be asked to wear a mask during skin to skin. There are no contraindications at all that um, this practice should be discontinued. And in fact, it should be very much encouraged. Mothers are also offered bedside help to initiate that first breastfeeding. Um, skin to skin is usually for at least an hour but can continue for as long as mother and infant are uh, stable and enjoying the care. Next slide, please. Um, if a mother does um, come into hospital and she is sick, um, the support person who comes can do skin to skin. So we see here um, that a father is able to do skin to skin with the newborn. Um, mother can breastfeed uh, whenever the baby wants. She may need some help to hold the baby um, to find a comfortable position. Um, if a mother is too sick to care for a baby, um, someone can help her um, extract the milk or use a breast pump to take the milk out. And then a person, um, a healthy support person who is there with her can give the milk to the baby. Um, pictured here is the um, hospital breast pump that a mother can have at her bedside. And mothers can also learn to hand express. Uh, next slide. Um, a lot of times um, moms get worried the first 24 hours their newborn is sleepy. Is the baby taking the breast enough times? Is the baby getting enough milk? Um, babies are um, very variable personalities, um, but the baby will show mom with um, some of those feeding cues or signs that um, they are getting interested in having breastfeeding. So the early cues, baby stirs from a deep sleep, um, starts to open and close his or her mouth, starts to turn and, and try to suck their fingers or fast. Um, so mother and baby are close um, with what they call the rooming in, where mother stays together with baby the entire stay. Um, she's doing skin to skin and these little cues can then be acted upon and breast can be offered whenever baby seems interested. Um, there's a little phrase that we use to remind mothers um, to feed the baby whenever the baby wants. Um, we say, watch the baby, not the clock. Um, just as we have different patterns of hunger or thirst, um, infants, little newborns do as well. And mothers should be encouraged to feed baby whenever they want to, um, whenever they see those signs, regardless of interval. Uh, next slide, please. Very important. Um, this is probably one of my pet peeves as a bedside um, provider. Um, breastfeeding should not hurt. Moms are um, sometimes, you know, told the stories, just like you tell a labor story that maybe can give you be a little scary. Um, a lot of moms may have heard that breastfeeding hurts. 
you have to ride it out or put up with it. Um, breastfeeding will cause sensations. You will feel baby pulls and tugs on the nipple. Um, sometimes the release of hormones can generate some cramping or discomfort. That's part of the normal recovery process, but it should not feel like um, the baby is biting or, or clamping on the breast or that the skin is burning or irritated. Um, mothers um, who are not sure if what they're feeling is, is the right way or if they are really in some pain to um, encourage to ask for their nurse or lactation for help right away. They, you don't want to wait until the nipple skin becomes injured and too sore to comfortably feed the baby. Next, please. Thanks. Um, so the early milk or first milk is perfect for baby. Um, they, there is a nice poster out, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, baby's first milk is the first immunization that um, immune transfer from mother um, to baby happens those first days. Very important to establish breastfeeding. Um, some mothers feel concern. The breast feels soft for the first couple of days. That's normal. This process um, builds a little bit each day. The milk volume increases as the baby takes the milk. So if baby wants to breastfeed very often, the milk volume increases. And um, there's also some changes that you can see. Um, most importantly, um, in the hospital, the baby's poopy diapers. Um, the first two days, baby's um, stool or poop, very um, sticky, like tar, spackle, and it's very dark black. And there's not really a lot of odor to it. Um, and sometimes to see such a dark stool, um, can look a little bit worrying, that, but that's very normal. That's what we expect to see. Um, next slide. As the milk supply increases um, over the days, baby is um, starting to get a little more awake and um, starting to feed more often, the poop will change color. It will change to be a little bit uh, more runny. So instead of being like um, spackled, it will be more like pudding and the color turns green. While the colors are turning green, um, mother will feel um, changes in her breasts. By that first week, the picture says day five to seven, the stool is that bright yellow, um, it can be very runny. Those are all normal changes. And if those changes are happening on these days of life, that is the indicator that the baby is doing well, getting enough milk and healthy baby. Next slide. So oftentimes what happens is mom leaves the hospital, breasts are still soft, that's very normal, but during that first week home, there were a lot of changes in mother's body. Um, breastfeeding at least 10 times every 24 hours can keep the breast soft enough for baby to attach and get fed. Um, sometimes the growth of the breast catches mom by surprise, it's very rapid. So um, if the breast is too full, baby is, has trouble attaching or staying attached, there are techniques to um, massage the breast and hand express or remove the milk by hand techniques to soften the breast and to help it easier for baby to attach and also to bring mother more comfort as the milk pressure is relieved. Um, there is a video link here and um, there are links throughout these presentations that are um, support to some teaching that we might do by phone or virtual consult. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that is emphasized in the hospital, um, as Liz brought up, the discharge is um, being expedited, if you will, for COVID. Um, sometimes mom vaginal delivery, 24, 36 hours, she's departing. Um, sometimes a C-section as early as 48 hours. Um, so to know what to expect at home, um, mothers are often given a document or a feeding log, and it will give a range of about how many feedings to expect. Eight to 12 um, is the popular phrase, um, eight or more in 24, um, again, encouraging feeding when the baby wants, and then tracking the diaper output. The graph here, um, this is from Ontario Best Start, um, Canadian National um, Breastfeeding Service, where it shows you each day how many feeds 
and about um, how many wet and dirty diapers to expect. That way uh, parents can track infant's progress. Um, this is especially helpful if an infant is very sleepy or very fussy to determine where you need to maybe intervene, wake the baby up for more feedings, or perhaps baby needs more comfort and consoling between feeds, but the baby is getting plenty of breast milk. Um, another concern that a lot of moms have is a breast pump access. So if um, insurance hasn't provided or WIC hasn't given information before delivery, mothers can get that information in the hospital. Just mention to the nurse that you would like someone to check that for you. And um, that information can be done right while you're in the hospital. Um, next slide. So um, resources are very plentiful, but um, sometimes um, some resources aren't quite as um, up to date or um, breastfeeding focused as you would like. So to help mothers navigate what is a good, um, a good resource, a reputable evidence-based resource, a supportive resource, um, direct phone contact, calling the lactation consultant at the hospital where you deliver, um, most um, hospitals have a warm line or a nurse or a lactation consult you can talk to. Um, a lot of hospitals are moving to the virtual platform. So if a mother needs more help outpatient, she can do that consult from her own home. Um, the WIC peer counselors um, are often trained to help troubleshoot um, with breastfeeding to ensure that questions are answered. And um, finally, a lot of times um, moms are worried um, if baby isn't waking and making the, the goals that were indicated in the hospital, or if baby is, seems inconsolable, um, always to call the baby's pediatrician for guidance and uh, making sure that everyone is on board knowing this is a young baby, this is a breastfeeding baby, to get those questions answered uh, quickly. The, um, the takeaway, um, if we talk mom to mom, is that um, breastfeeding, is natural, yes, but you learn to do it. Your baby learns to do it. You do it together. And that with a little help, um, breastfeeding will go from seeming um, kind of strange and new and, and maybe hard to get comfortable. Within a few days, a couple of weeks, you start to really um, be a great team, you and your baby. And um, any of us here or throughout the state, we're always, always happy to talk to you, to encourage you, and to help you along. Well, Nikki, Liz, and Leslie, thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, so we'll open it up to questions um, or comments from anybody who is participating today. And again, you feel free to put any questions or comments into the chat, or you can unmute your microphone. And if there are no questions from the participants, um, I would encourage our presenters, if there's information that you would like to get from our participants today that might help you inform where you're going next and what information is needed, please feel free to share some discussion questions. Um, so I would like to ask a question, um, being part of an inpatient team, um, to make sure that care is effective and compassionate. Um, we do have some materials that we give that are translated into Spanish. Um, some of the other languages that we frequently encounter need for are um, Arabic or Nepali. Um, is there, um, maybe this question best directed to Liz, um, is there an approach that seems um, more uh, nurturing of mother to address the fears? Um, is it impersonal to give the written information? Is it impersonal to use a translate phone? What, what's a good approach? I think that really depends upon the family and really depends upon you know, the, the situation of the woman. I think that um, we as uh, healthcare providers, we, do, we give them plenty of information during the prenatal and we have the face-to-face -face conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's all, always very important to have that connection with them 
to establish a relationship with the mom and, and not to just uh, do it in a rush at the last minute, it, you know, that they're just leaving the hospital and then, okay, here it is, here's a package for you. Yeah, it is translated, goodbye type of thing. But because of uh, the situation of COVID-19, just to, uh, it really depends again on, on the mother, but always have the approach to uh, call the mother, ask her the question, do you like, what is your preference? Do you want to talk face to face? Do you want to come back? Do you want to have a discussion over over the phone? Um, how can we help you? Uh, what is the best way that you learn? Are you a visual person or are you somebody more of the kind of person that you just prefer to just read plenty of information? Uh, do you have a computer? Do you have a phone? Uh, do you have ways to read? Um, do you have uh, the information? Uh, do you do you understand the information that gave, that we gave you here prenatally, um, or do you have any other questions about the pump? Uh, do you have weak? Are you a weak recipient? Uh, because it just depends on so many things. Uh, also, the the mom can be diabetic. The mom can have some other complications, which may breastfeeding a little bit more difficult. So just always try to have as much interaction with her before previously and not just necessary towards the last minute. Well, thank you for that question, Leslie, and also Liz for that response. So does anyone else who is online, especially those who are working in that environment have any um, insight to share with Leslie? Okay, I don't see any questions and I see no microphones unmuting. Um, other questions, comments from either the panel or our participants? I, this is Nikki and it's, um, you know, breastfeeding is still not the cultural norm for anybody in the United States. So doing this work is extremely challenging and we all feel kind of like Sisyphus sometimes pushing the rolling the boulder uphill and we get ahead and then something happens and it comes back. So um, I'm curious as to what kind of networks people are in who are watching this presentation right now. Are they part of a breastfeeding network or a connection with childcare providers? Are there resources out there that the coalition, the Pennsylvania Breastfeeding Coalition, doesn't know about that we should be connecting with. You know, um, you people, I'm grateful that so many have come to watch today. And what's the story in your community? You know, where, where do people, where are they referred? How can we make our network stronger and well publicized and embracing of everyone? So that's my question to all the participants. I'm really interested to know what's, what's your background, what's your arena? And it's really easy to unmute your mic. <laughs> or go ahead and type things into the chat. Right. We are open to either. Hi there, it's Andrea Murray. Can everybody hear me? Yes, you can. Oh, good, good. So I had formerly worked for the WIC program, and I know a lot of the WIC offices are currently closed, um, but seeing a lot of their participants uh, virtually. And um, I know sometimes when providing breastfeeding education, it might be a little bit more difficult to do that via the telephone or um, um, through a, a telephonic type of uh, presentation. Is there any pointers or any tips that um, the Pennsylvania Breastfeeding Coalition could give about um, breastfeeding support over the phone? Well, that's a fantastic question. I think we're all figuring that out now. So, um, and in Philadelphia, what Philadelphia has done is launch the Pacify app in the city 
where people can download an app and then they within 28 seconds you can someone a lactation professional is there in in your face helping you out at one in the morning or two in the afternoon whenever you need it and some of the information that we're getting back from um, how it's being utilized shows that the majority of calls occur between 5 p.m and 1 a.m so i think if we're talking about providing support we need to expand beyond the Monday through Friday nine to five aspect to it and think about, you know, we, we, I mean, I don't want to be up at one in the morning answering a call, but um, I'd be certainly happy to do it at dinner time. You know, I think if we expand our availability and make that aware through social media, um, most, most neighborhoods have Facebook groups, all little neighborhoods, you know, so finding out what the neighborhoods are in your community and connecting with them and, and, and building a network that way. Um, and maybe going to work later so that you can be paid to work until eight o'clock at night, you know, if you come at noon, for example. I think those are the kinds of things that we need to expand because the virtual world never goes away. Whereas the real world, unless we're working in a hospital doing our shift work somewhere, you know, we're basically Monday through Friday, nine to five, which is what WIC is. So I would like to see that happen, an expansion into outside traditional business hours as one way of doing it. And then finding all your little local neighborhood Facebook groups and putting out information that way. Um, people, I'm surprised at the telelactation, how wonderful it can be. I mean, just that's a way of having a connection. You see a face, you have a conversation. And then the question you ask is, when do you want me to call you again? And you have, and that's a question you have to ask, or you have to ask, where did you put my telephone number so you can text me anytime? And reminding her that she has that number. Where is it? It's in my phone or it's on a piece of paper on the dresser, you know, just to reinforce our availability. So that's just a couple of ideas that I have. Um, anybody else? There is a comment in the chat. Chelsea is sharing that she's from Lancaster, mm -hmm. Lancaster, um, and a PA in family medicine. She's looking towards becoming an IBCLC to help bring more support to her practice and area because it is lacking. Um, she would love to provide a telehealth service um, for it as a healthcare provider. Um, so she could prescribe the medications that are needed. Um, also mentions she would love to touch base with a PS PSH, Penn State Health LC, to discuss this further. Um, she's currently breastfeeding a six month old and has several patients and friends who are breastfeeding. So she's getting a lot of information through work in CDC. Thank you for sharing that, Chelsea. Thank you. And Chelsea, I'd like to add in telehealth. So we have um, our, we have a lactation team at the health department, which is three women. One, is, Anna, is from Bolivia, so she's you know she takes the calls in Spanish. We have Jalisa and Tahira, and Jalisa and Tahira are both nursing their own babies. And I think one of the advantages of telelactation is you can use your own baby in the interaction because it totally changes the dynamic of the conversation when the two-year-old wanders in and wants to nurse or you're hold, she's holding her four month old and nursing while she's having a conversation. And having done this myself, I took my baby with me when I taught classes all over the city. It just opens a very different kind of door. So that I would encourage, that's something you can do safely when you're doing these virtual visits. It's, to, and it's another way of making that connection because that's what we really need. So um, I have a quick question if that's, oh, go ahead, Leslie, please go ahead. Oh, I was gonna just kind of add on to that. Um, there are resources um, for lactation consultants to access that give you um, framework and guidelines to uh, make a, a more effective um, telehealth consultation. It's um, pointers about everything from how to set up your area with the proper lighting, uh, make sure you have props if you're going to be teaching hand expression or how to use a pump. Um, and then doing a little bit of pre-work, um, setting goals with mom, um, finding out a little bit more about her history. And um, in some respects, 
telehealth can actually be a, a little more effective um, if you have somebody who can hold their phone camera or their laptop camera, because when you come into an office for outpatient, you do the work there on that chair or sofa, whatever it is. And one of the common um, feedbacks that we get is um, a mom will be saying in her follow-up phone call, um, it worked great in the hospital. It worked great when I came back from my outpatient and now we're doing back to the same thing again. So by being able to go virtual, you can go to their house and you can see where they are comfortable, what that resource they have nearby. So um, virtual kind of started as, I don't know, I want to call it last resort, like, oh, we got to do something. But I think it really has brought a new perspective to how we can provide care. Thank you for that. Um, and Jackie, you had something you wanted to add? Or I, I do want to share that um, Cheston has listed the Penn State Health breastfeeding resource number in our chat, 717-531-6455. Um, and we'll make sure that that's noted in our follow-ups as well. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, I think, um, Nikki, when you were talking, you were saying it was an uphill battle in terms of you know, the acceptance and, and having um, you know, women breastfeeding. Do you have a sense of um, how COVID-19 may or may not impact um, social acceptance? And uh, as we open more counties, um, do you think it will be more of a challenge for women who are breastfeeding or won't it make a difference? Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can only imagine um, the, the challenges that COVID presents to breastfeeding occur at the very beginning in the hospital because you have people operating from a belief-based hierarchy of practice. Um, so that's very different from an evidence-based practice. So we're seeing, and especially with our Hispanic families, we're seeing much more of a, or a judgment-based practice is another way that people... So it, it, COVID has a very powerful impact at the very beginning which I think has been a big focus of this presentation that we've given. It's like, how do you support it at the very beginning? Yeah, you gotta do stuff at home, but you gotta get them going first. So that's where the major impact goes. As far as what happens afterwards, I have no idea. Who could ever have imagined anything would be happening like this? I don't know, what do you think, Leslie? Do you think imagine anything would be in the community with breastfeeding and the impact with COVID? You're muted, Leslie. Hang on. Mike. Oh, that. Yeah. Sorry, I was mu musing on the mute. Um, I think it's brought some things into focus that um, people maybe didn't want to talk about. Um, we're starting to really have some critical conversations about how isolated our mothers feel, how stressful it is to be a new mother, um, how people are asking to get their own needs met. Um, people maybe are articulating things a little differently. Uh, and that, that's kind of what I've seen. Um, it's, it might be a strange perspective, but um, because I go into the hospital and I've been considered an essential worker, my day to day hasn't changed all that much. So I'm going on, on what I'm picking up from others. Okay, thank you for sharing that. We have one final question in the chat. Um, Shell wants to know how, how do you, um, actually two questions, how do you um, get the televisit set up um, with patients who would prefer not to leave a footprint, no phone, email, etc.? And I see Leslie um, did provide some input, but I'll, I'll open that up to both of you now. Hmm. So these are people that are fearing follow through from people that are undocumented, people that are immigrants, that you're talking specifically about that population. Well, the Pacify app doesn't collect any of that information. We're not interested in anything like that. The, and so just letting that no, let be known in the community. We're, we're here to help you with breastfeeding. We don't care who you vote for or where you go to church or where you come from or anything like that. We care about you and your baby having the best relationship that's possible and reinforcing that we do not, we are not linked with anything connecting information. That was one of the first questions that we at the city asked when we were in negotiation with the Pacify staff was about protecting 
those, you know, the confidentiality of the visits for the people using the service. So that's something can easily be built into whatever system you're using. And one, one last question, I think last, we are almost out of time. Um, Chelsea wants to know, has um, anyone been doing or aware of research with COVID antibodies in breast milk and how that might affect the baby? Well, I know that there's research looking at that now. There are I mean, researchers around the world are studying human milk for two reasons. One, we're looking for virus, they're looking for virus in it. And secondly, is there something in the milk that is specifically protective? We know that human milk in, in the lab, in vitro, can kill cancer cells, can kill HIV, can kill lots of different things. So that's like, a, there is research and it's just opening up now, like everything else is about COVID. We've only been dealing with this for not even six months globally. So. There's a lot cooking all over the world. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I can wrap up two questions at once, I think. Um, there is a webinar series um, from the California Breastfeeding Coalition is free uh, webinars. And one of the topics that they talked about was immunology and breast milk. You might find that interesting. And then also, um, as far as the um, patient who does not want to leave a digital footprint, um, I'm not sure if this is helpful or not, but um, the hospital where I work has it set up uh, with the levels of confidentiality as any other telehealth or telemedicine visit. It's like going to the doctor. So communications are encrypted, et cetera. I don't know if that completely answers the question. I'll try to get a more complete answer for you. All right, thank you for that, Leslie um, and Nikki again. Thank you both. And I think we lost Liz along the way. Um, but just a few quick wrap up announcements. Um, Reminder that you are able to collect CMEs for participating today. A survey will be sent following the session and you can use the same survey for each session that you attend. As mentioned earlier, all materials, including um, the recording link will be shared in a follow-up email. And finally, I hope you'll join us for our next session. Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner joins us again on, in our skilled nursing facilities COVID series on Thursday, May 21st at 4 p.m please continue to watch your email for additional sessions. Thank you everyone, um, stay safe and enjoy your weekend.